Hey, welcome back to the computer hardware and OS essentials lecture series. And if you haven't seen my previous videos, I will post a link in the description for the playlist. I created these custom lectures based on A plus certification program, but with few enhancements to improve your IT technical skills and knowledge. And this would be our fourth lecture. And I will go over processors also known as central processing unit or CPUs. The primary objective of this lecture is to cover what is the fundamental function of uh, processors or CPUs, compare some characteristics and features of Intel and AMD processors used for personal computers, introduce to the differences between desktop laptop processors and the server processors, and learn a little bit about how we can select and install uh, processors based on your customers or end users needs. So what are the processors or CPUs? Processor is also known as CPU or central processing unit. It is basically the brain of your computer containing all the circuitry needed to process input, store data and output result. It performs basic arithmetic logic controlling and input output operations specified by the instructions in the program. The manufacturers of processors include Intel and AMD, and the first commercial microprocessor was uh, created for mass use by Intel in 1971, and it is called Intel 4004. And CPUs are microprocessors, but not every microprocessor is a CPU, keep that in mind. And the microprocessor is an integrated circuit that is made out of millions of transistors. So those are key features of a CPU. So the Intel's first um, uh, microprocessor looks like this, and it is a chip, uh, and it is called Intel 4004, and it was uh, done in 1971. Um, modern day, all uh, microprocessors uh, are um, uh, built uh, based, uh, based on silicon chipsets, and almost all of them, uh, and What's really important here you need to understand is CPUs are microprocessors. However, not all microprocessors are considered as CPUs. So just because of something is a microprocessor doesn't mean it is a CPU. The processor performance and uh, compatibility is depend on the processor speed, uh, lithography, socket and chipset the processor can use. Uh, the multiprocessing abilities such as uh, multiprocessing, multi-threading, multi-core processing, dual processors, for example, especially with servers, um, memory cache, memory features on the motherboard that the processor can support, uh, support for virtualization, integrated graphics, and overclocking abilities. Because not all processors gonna have the same features uh, associated uh, with uh, you know these uh, particular items so it is different from processor to processor for example overclocking may not be po possible on every single processor um, not all processors have the sa same type of uh, uh, cache uh, etc etc so this all going to be uh, different from processor to processor and uh, the type of process processor that you go with like for example server processor versus a desktop processor versus a laptop processor so the processor performance and compatibility depends on all of these key items how a processor works so basic components of a processor include the input and output also known as io unit which manages data and instructions entering and leaving the processor uh, it also has something called a control unit, which manages all activities inside the processor. And one or more arithmetic logic units uh, within that processor that performs all logical uh, comparisons and calculations. So ALUs are very important because that is pretty much the heart of a uh, CPU. Registers, uh, those are small holding areas on processor chip and holds counters, data, instructions, and addresses. Uh, ALUs um, is currently uh, processing. So they are, that's the primary per, uh, you know, uh, function of a registers. Internal memory caches also included in a processor. Those are typically known as L1, L2, and L3 caches. Those hold data and instructions to be processed by the ALU. 
uh, buses, uh, which I have introduced to you in my previous lecture, connect components within the processor housing. And those uh, buses uh, uh, that we see on the outside the motherboard, like on the motherboard itself, interact with the buses inside the processor uh, housing as well. So a standard two arithmetic logic units uh, used uh, since Intel Pentium processor released in 1993 uh, can be uh, summarized in a, a diagram uh, seen on the left hand side of your screen. So how typical Intel processors work is uh, the this is the Pentium version of the Intel processor. Uh, it has two ALUs uh, that is internal data bus uh, with the 32 uh, bits wide. And we have a backside uh, bus, which is this side right here. And we have internal me internal memory cache. And the I/O unit is sitting in front of all of these all of these items: the registers, the ALUs, the internal memory cache, and the control unit. In front of that, the I/O unit going to sit. And then the front side bus or the external um, data bus is uh, 64 bits wide, and that's where you uh, interact with your uh, the Intel Pentium type processors. And this similar architecture uh, that was first used by Intel in 1993 is being used by most all, or if not all of the uh, Intel processors, even in 2022, as well as um, similar processes used on AMD processors uh, that has a similar architecture built into it. Uh, so all the all those components that I discussed right here, uh, the I/O unit, control unit, the ALU, the registers, the cache, and the buses. Uh, they interact uh, within the processor in a similar fashion as this Pentium CPU, which was first released in 1993, even in modern day. So that's how uh, the you know the basically how the architecture works. Processor frequency, also known as the speed, uh, is what we use to gauge how fast a processor can process certain information. So the which is basically speed at which the processor operates internally. And the multiplier is the factor multiplied against the system bus frequency and that determines the processor frequency. So the multiplier is a type of a factor based on the manufacturer specifications uh, that would uh, multi get multiplied against the bus frequency in you know, order for you to determine the, what is the actual processor frequency going to be. So the system bus frequency multiplied by the multiplier would actually give you the real life, um, you know, real world um, processor frequency. Processors uh, sold today contain ALUs and registers uh, that can process 32 bits or 62 bits at a time. So modern day processors can do 32 bits or 62 bits at the same time. On the next slide, we will discuss that a little bit uh, further. Uh, so the modern processor architecture uh, is, um, you know, can be summarized uh, as this on the right hand side, this diagram. So we'll have you know, uh, this is a code processor situation. Uh, you, you know, you, the modern processors can work together in tandem with multiple uh, CPUs. So imagine this is your server, right? This is most commonly found in servers. You can have, uh, you know, four CPUs and they can work in tandem and work together in modern architecture. And the modern architecture includes the 32-bit processors, which is the older version of the modern architecture, uh, that known as X86 uh, processors, and that can handle 32-bit instructions from the operating systems. And it only can do 32-bit because it's can only the architecture that only support uh, in that um, uh, bit uh, instructions. The hybrid processors, which is uh, currently uh, very common in the market, is known as x86-64 processors, and that can handle both 32-bit as well as 64-bit uh, operating system instructions. Uh, and it was first released by AMD, uh, and it is called the AMD64 when it was first came into the market. Uh, the Intel processors can also nowadays can handle x64 and um, sorry, x86-64 processors. So uh, those processors can do either 32-bit or 64-bit operating systems. This is one of the reasons why modern processors can handle either, uh, for example, Microsoft Windows um, uh, 11 64-bit version or 32-bit version because those are actually hybrid processors. Like if you have Intel i5, for example, most of the i5s nowadays are hybrid processors. So you can handle either 32-bit or 64-bit architecture. 
the 64-bit processors, also known as the X64 processors, um, sometimes are called IA64, uh, requires a 64-bit operating system and can handle 32-bit applications only by simulating 32-bit processing. So in this situation, if you have a processor where it only can handle 64-bit architecture, so 64-bit threads, what's going to happen is operating system will be operating at 64 bits, but it can emulate or and or simulate the environment. So emulate this is not just simulation, but also it can emulate the 32-bit uh, processing environments uh, that would allow you to still run 32-bit applications even though the operating system is actually running at the 64-bit uh, architecture. Processor memory. So memory cache in processors are typically referred to as L1, L2, or L3 cache. And basically each core in a processor has its own L1 and L2 caches, and all cores must share an L3 cache within the processor package. And how, why we do this? Because the engineers that who have designed these processors have found by doing this, that we improve the performance of the processor. So that's why we divide, instead of having a one single cache module, we have three cache modules, L1, L2, and L3, and the each core uh, in the processor has its own L1 and L2. However, the L3 will be shared among all cores, hence that is the best option, the best highest performance that you can get out of the processor cache memory. So that's, what, that's the reason uh, why we have the L1, L2, and L3 division. And we have a memory controller uh, included in the processor package, and that would significantly increase uh, in uh, the performance of the processor because the memory controller now going to manage those L1, L2, L3s uh, along with the uh, the cores that would be using it. So in here, here's a, a diagram of a quad core processor with uh, four cores, and each core uh, has a cache that is. Uh, associated with L1 and L2 right here and the, each one each core has an L1 within the core itself and it ha also has the L2 uh, built into it uh, uh, you know uh, associated with it um, uh, the outside of that core uh, however it is specific to that core so this L2 is specific to that core that L2 is specific to that core etc etc but then we have the L3 cache which is completely independent of all of these and would be sharing among all of these cores, all four cores. And all of these uh, cache will be handled and controlled by the memory controller uh, up here. So this is an uh, overall picture of how the L1, L2, L3 cache uh, would work uh, with a, a quad core processor. So if somebody asks you, why do we have L1 and L2 and L3? Because it improves performance and it significantly increases the system performance by uh, you know, working with the memory controller. So let's look at Intel processors. Current families of processors for desktops and laptops include Intel Core processors, those include Intel i9 and Intel i7, which are made for high-end desktops and laptops, uh, as along with the i5, which is well suited for mainstream desktops and laptops. Uh, so if you have an office computer, uh, you're probably uh, you're looking at maybe Intel i5s unless your company has like engineers use or uh, researchers who need that i9, i7 uh, capabilities. Uh, and in Intel i3 is an entry-level processor for desktops and laptops, which I also have seen some companies have used for their end users because they don't need that kind of a high processing power. So they can some do uh, some, you know, have some cost savings associated with that. Uh, Pentium processors, uh, those are designed for entry-level desktops and laptops. Uh, nowadays, um, you still can buy Pentium processors for certain uh, applications such as mini PCs uh, where you may not need that much power. Uh, Atom processors, those are made for low-end desktops, notebooks, and laptops. Again, you still can buy them, but you know, it's in 2022, it's rarely a, an option that a lot of people pick. And the Celeron processors are made for low-end uh, uh, netbook and laptops. Again, uh, this may be 
popular in maybe um, some certain countries like maybe in in uh, Asia or maybe in areas where uh, there is a need for uh, low uh, cost um, computers they may go with those items but uh, modern day uh, most of the time in North America and Europe I see the i3 as the lowest entry level processors for even for laptops uh, and then uh, moving up from uh, there so some Intel uh, mobile processors are packaged in a Centrino processor technology uh, and the Intel processors, chipset and wireless network adapters are all interconnected as a single unit that improve uh, laptop performance. So the Centrino uh, processor technology, which is used by the Intel, what it's gonna do is it has all the components for a processor, chipset and the wireless network adapter all in one chip. So it's in a one die. As a result of that, it increased the performance and it gives you much better uh, also um, uh, uh, usage of um, battery, especially, uh, you know, if you have Centrinos are typically used on laptops, so it will increase the performance of the battery as well. So instead of draining the battery faster, now it will drain a little bit uh, slower as a result of having a much more efficiently built one single processor uh, chipset wireless network adapter all in a one unit. So those are called Centrino processor technology. Those are specific to Intel. Intel dominates the market for servers with highly stable and powerful processors. Uh, those uh, models uh, of Core i9, i7, i5 and Core i3 processors are designed for uh, server use as well. Uh, so you can actually use a server software uh, with the Intel i9s, i7s, i5s and i3s if you wanted to use it uh, for server purposes uh, for let's say in a small business for environment. However, for high-end uh, servers, Intel also offers Xeon uh, or Xenon uh, and Xenon 5 and Itanium uh, 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 processors. So most common of those uh, in the server world is a Xeon or Xenon. Uh, Xeon processors are very uh, commonly used even in small business environment. Not so much uh, the Itanium uh, processors, but uh, Xenon for sure in 2022. So for example, the servers that I have at my house for my uh, educational purposes, I have servers for like last 10, 15 years. Uh, I, all of them have uh, Intel Xeon processors because those are the most common type of high-end server processors you, uh, you can get in the market. Processor identification with respect to Intel company uh, is very easy uh, nowadays because the processor numbers uh, can be uh, defined based on the last uh, couple of digits. For example, the Intel um, uh, Core i7 processors uh, can be identified based on the i7 at the front. Uh, and then the 940, the first nine mean is the ninth generation, for example. So like, it is very easy to identify processors um, with the Intel, um, you know, naming conventions nowadays because they have designed um, that way. Uh, I have also introduced this concept in my previous lecture. So if you haven't seen my video for my previous lecture, go to my YouTube channel and check that out uh, because I actually describe this um, Intel, uh, but uh, you know, uh, Intel ar architecture and how you can define those separate, uh, you know, uh, define those the generations and different types of processors just by looking at uh, the model number because it's it's pretty easy to do that uh, as a uh, IT technician. So let's look at AMD processors, uh, switch gears to AMD. So the processors by AMD are popular in the game and hobbyist market as opposed to a corporate and uh, enterprise market. Even though AMD is gaining popularity with some enterprise server servers uh, nowadays in 2022. So, because the AMD was initially targeting the gaming and hobbyist market, they are they used to be at least generally less expensive than uh, comparable uh, processors from Intel. Even today, AMD uh, try to keep uh, that competitiveness in the market and trying to keep the cost as uh, a little bit lower than that of the Intel. Um, but uh, with uh, higher end AMDs, uh, this may not be the case because there are AMDs that are actually as expensive as the Intel processors, especially with when it comes to servers and extremely high end uh, uh, devices. 
So the current AMD processor families includes for desktop, we have Ryzen, Ryzen Pro, Ryzen Threadripper, A-Series, A-Series Pro, and FX. And for laptops, we have the Ryzen, Ryzen Pro, A-Series, and A-Series Pro. And for uh, the, uh, servers, we have the AMD Epic and Optreon. So uh, Epic is one of the most commonly used AMD server enterprise grade uh, processors right now in 2022. Uh, and um, I would say Ryzen Pro and Threadripper are most enthusiast uh, desktop gaming, uh, high, um, uh, you know, high usage PC processors in, uh, currently in use. So if you are running AutoCAD programs, uh, you pr pr if you are an engineer, for example, you may want to look into buying a, a Ryzen Pro or a Ryzen Threadripper because that will give you the most out of uh, your PC. So keep that in mind. So this is another company and they have their own line of uh, processors for both desktop and uh, servers. So here's a, just a quick overview contrast of laptops and server processors. So uh, because unlike the desktop processors, laptop processors and server processors, uh, in my opinion, are specialized processors. Uh, they are specifically built for a specific purpose as opposed to desktop processors. I could consider them as like a general uh, processors because we have been building de desktop processors since like 1980s. Uh, but the laptops and server processes are becoming more and more and more specialized uh, as time goes on. So laptop processes are purpose-built, as I mentioned, and usually low energy consumption compared to servers and desktop processes, and typically almost always uh, low profile as it, it could get. So what that means is basically, if you look at the right-hand side, the image of a laptop processor, it is extremely small and very compact. So it, it, it compact as much uh, chips uh, set in, into this as possible. So it has a, as many transistors that it can fit in as tiny as possible. So as the nanotechnology and um, other technologies get improved, I expect the laptop processors to get even smaller because we are trying to save physical space when we are building laptops as opposed to desktop and servers, we have enough space to put, uh, you know, a little bit of a bigger processor. Maybe it will provide better cooling and better performance uh, in especially uh, long running programs. Uh, you know, uh, that's why um, maybe even gaming laptops cannot keep up with a gaming desktop. Sometimes gaming laptops can't even keep up with a regular uh, desktop. That there is a reason for that is because laptops are purpose built and typically laptops are for mobility as opposed to power. Even though there are, I know there are gaming laptops and there are high end enterprise laptops that you can buy in the market, laptops still going to be uh, not going to be a cost efficient option if you need performance. Uh, so if you look at the servers also, uh, when, when, you, when you contrast servers to desktop and laptops, uh, both Intel and AMD also manufacture server-focused processors, as I mentioned before. However, the server processors can be considered as what I call a workhorse uh, CPU. So the server processors, uh, which also know, we call it like CPUs, right? The central processing unit are considered as like a workhorse. These are purpose-built to run multiple threads at a high calculations at a very uh, efficient way. Uh, is what the you know primary goal of a server CPU. And server uh, processors are specifically designed to work in tandem with multiple processors. Uh, so if you have my, my two or three Intel i9 processors, if you put them together in a one single motherboard, if there is a motherboard available there for that, they are not optimized to actually work in tandem. But however, Intel Xeon processors, Intel Xeon processor uh, family that has um, a, a support for uh, multiple uh, processors working together in tandem, uh, you can buy a uh, motherboard with multiple processor uh, uh, configurations, such as two uh, configuration or four configuration, for example, and you can populate them uh, with processors and all those four processors of Intel Xeon will work in tandem. So that is specifically built that way in server processors. 
and it can support large uh, RAM ca capacities compared to desktop and laptop. So if you look at the processors for uh, Intel and AMD desktop computers, they have a, uh, a little bit of a less capacity support uh, for RAM compared to uh, a server processor. Uh, an example would be the servers can support uh, sometimes up to 512 gigabyte of uh, RAM uh, as uh, or up even even one terabyte of RAM on a one single processor nowadays. Uh, but compare that to a desktop processor, the maximum RAM support probably gonna cap at around like 256 maybe maximum gigabyte. Why? Because you would never need more than probably 64 to uh, maybe uh, uh, 128 uh, DDR4 uh, RAM. Uh, you don't need more than that. Even my com high end computer, this one doesn't have that much RAM because there is no need for it. But for servers, there is a need for it. So those server uh, processors can handle extremely large uh, RAM capacities. And another thing because of this, um, um, uh, these capabilities, server uh, processors are uh, higher. Uh, in terms of cost per unit compared to the laptops and desktop processors uh, because of these purpose-built uh, infrastructure, uh, purpose-built structures in the uh, CPU itself. And also I want to point out one more thing. Uh, in the old days, server processors are specifically built to run 24 seven, never been shut down uh, servers so that servers will be always on. Uh, so the des all days desktop processors and uh, laptop processors may uh, have some heating issues, uh, but in 2022 with good thermal uh, paste and good thermal um, uh, configurations, uh, whether air cooling or liquid cooling, you can make um, uh, you know laptops and desktop even run 24/7 for uh, months and years at a time. You should ha shouldn't have any problem. But the servers from right out of the gate since 1990s and 19, 2000s, 1990s, right out of the gate, server processors are specifically to run, built to run 24-7, 365 days per year and years and years without shutting down the servers, right? So, however, word of caution on here, servers still do need maintenance. So you may have to, uh, you know, um, uh, reapply the thermal paste on uh, servers uh, as servers get older. Uh, most uh, large enterprises and companies would just throw the entire server out and get a brand new server. Uh, but small businesses, if you are a technician working in a small business environment, and if you see a, a Intel Xeon, for example, server uh, running there for years and years and years, every couple of years, I would recommend that you remove the um, you know thermal housing reapply thermal paste and put it back together because that will improve the thermal uh, throttling per, uh, associated with those. How, uh, whatever it is you're gonna do to improve it, uh, you don't have to do much with server processes because they are built to run in a longer uh, term as opposed to laptop and desktop processes. Again, in 2022, with desktop processors and server processors, they are getting closer to each other in terms of capabilities. So, um, you know, in terms of endurance uh, and the failure rates, it's not a big deal, but it is still server processors are still built with much more higher quality, uh, you know, components in my opinion, compared to the consumer grade uh, processors. So let's look at selecting a processor. Remember, I have mentioned this before in my previous lectures as well as these uh, slides, the CPU must be compatible with the motherboard and the chipset. You can just randomly buy a CPU and stick it into a random motherboard. The motherboard and the CPU uh, and the chipset has to work together. So whatever the CPU you pick, it has to be compatible with your motherboard and the chipset. The desktop processors, laptop processors, and server processors are three different categories that usually cannot be interchange. Why did I say it's usually in here when I describe it? Because you can install a server OS on desktop computers and most of the time you can install desktop operating systems on servers. So you can uh, install uh, Windows uh, um, uh, 11 Professional, for example, on a Xeon Intel server processor. You can install uh, 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 Windows Server 2018 or something like that on an Intel i7 processor. However, 
um, you know, uh, it, it is a use case scenario. So if you are running a small business, you may want to use an i7 processor with a, uh, you know, i7 processor with the Windows Server. Uh, however, um, you know, you still should look into Xeon processors because there are cheaper options for server processors as well. You can just go to a low end uh, servers uh, oriented uh, processor as opposed to running the uh, your server operating system on a desktop uh, processor, right? So yeah, it, keep that in mind. Uh, but certainly I would not recommend installing a server operating system on a laptop processor. I don't even know why anybody wants to install a server on a laptop. Uh, other than uh, there are some field uh, cases where you may have to install a Linux server on a, a laptop uh, because uh, you need it in the field. Like let's say you are in a rural Alberta and you are working on a project and you need a small server to uh, do TFTP or something like that to install uh, Cisco iOS images on a bunch of um, but same Cisco iOS image on a bunch of Cisco switches or routers, uh, you can basically quickly say, install uh, Linux on a virtual environment or on a laptop itself, and then you can run the server capabilities on there. So, you know, in modern day, the server features and configurations are not completely separated and cannot be interchanged with the desktop applications and other uh, items, but it is not recommended. We recommend that you use desktop processors for desktop applications and server processors for server applications and operating systems. So what should you consider when selecting a processor? You should look at the customer or end user needs and wants. Uh, a lot of people remember to ask about the needs but never ask about the wants because sometimes the wants can become a need uh, as the company grows or the your customer's need grows. So keep that in mind. So don't just build a a computer that will satisfy current needs, but maybe you need to look at the future and the expansion when you are selecting things. You have to select the motherboard according to that, and you have to uh, select the processor that match with the motherboard uh, and uh, the the specifications. So specifications or type. What I mean by that uh, in that bullet point uh, is that you can have an Intel motherboard but you, you may not uh, have an Intel processor that is compatible with, with that motherboard. So you need to make sure not only your motherboard can handle Intel or AMD, whatever you are picking, but that AMD motherboard can support the specific AMD processor that you're gonna use. So if you're using Ryzen processor, you may you are not being, gonna be able to put a Threadripper uh, uh, AMD uh, processor install on the Ryzen motherboard because Threadripper have different pin configuration and different design, so you can stick it in there. So you need to make sure the type, not only just the model and you know, the manufacturer is taken into consideration when you're picking those processors. Processor features to consider also includes the use, uh, the highest performing processor uh, that the board can support. So if you buy an Intel supporting board or an AMD supporting board, and it has a different varieties of uh, processes that uh, it can uh, support. Uh, I, I I would recommend you go with the highest performing processor. You can put it onto that board because that will uh, give you the uh, future expansion. You know, future you know cover the future needs, right? Uh, the only reason you wouldn't do that is if there's a huge cost difference between the uh, lower supporting processor and the highest supporting processor. So this could happen in the server environment. So a lot of server Intel Xenon uh, boards can support Xenon low-end processors all the way to Xenon or Xeon uh, very high-end uh, ones. So the uh, Xenon processors could go for $600 all the way to $2,500. So in that situation, you may want to discuss with your customer or end user and decide whether you're going to go with the $600 Xenon processor or uh, the $2,500 Xenon processor or somewhere in the middle. So discuss that with your um, end user. but. Uh, for home use desktop computers, I would typically try to go with the highest uh, supporting um, uh, uh, processor for that motherboard. Because if you can buy the highest supporting uh, processor for that motherboard for the, that user, uh, then you basically wasted your money uh, for that end user for the motherboard. Because the motherboard cost also changes based on uh, how high up the processor uh, family that it can support, right? 
So if you have a gamer, for example, and ask you to build a gaming desktop and you buy a really high-end motherboard and put a really low-end uh, uh, processor, that doesn't make any sense to me. So it may be for future upgradability, but processors are one of those items that end user rarely upgrade. So if you buy a motherboard for your end user, they have a specific gaming motherboard, for example, I would buy the highest uh, processor that support that gaming motherboard. Also, you need to understand the processor's ability to multitask uh, because not all processors are built equally for multitasking. And you need to understand the ba balancing of performance uh, and power of the CPU with that of the entire system. So if you have a really powerful CPU, for example, I have Intel i9 processor. And if I don't have a really good graphic card, which I do, um, it's gonna probably not gonna uh, fit me well uh, as a, a YouTuber, right? So I make YouTube uh, nowadays, uh, it's my new hobby. Uh, and if I don't have the proper GPU support, what's the point of having an Intel i9? So right now I use my Intel i9 and my GPU for the highest level possible because I do a 4K rendering of these videos. But if I have Intel i9 installed, but I don't have the GPU support for it, well, I'm basically wasting my money. That's mean power is never going to be used. So you need to balance the performance and power of the CPU with the entire system components, such as the GPUs, uh, the memory, for example, like I have DDR4, highest, uh, uh, you know, like a highest uh, frequency RAM, I believe, uh, that would allow me to use to get the maximum out of my uh, Intel i9 uh, CPU. And also my Intel i9 is overclocked. It's an Intel i9K type processor. Uh, so is for that especially you need to have the you know the 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 ram support and everything i believe my computer have 128 gigabyte of ram as well which is overkill but you know you don't want to do overkill for your uh for your end users because that would be wasting money and you're quoting a higher price for your end user that should not have been quoted at the first place so here's a question that a lot of uh, enthusiasts of computer science uh, ask do the CPU benchmarks matter? Well, in my opinion, no, it doesn't matter. As long as you pick the proper CPU for your end user or your customer or for your server, it really doesn't matter. Like for example, if uh, Intel Xenon uh, or Xeon uh, V version one Pentium, uh, sorry, Platinum uh, processor is good enough for your, um, uh, your server um, uh, and it is good enough for the long-term use I don't see a point of looking at this benchmark and worrying about benchmark and same goes for the desktops if your end user is a gamer probably in uh, Intel Core i7 is good enough 9700k yeah, for example the case uh, uh, processors will allow them to also overclock safely so they can overclock these processors not only out in in the BIOS and a UEFI, they, the, the Intel comes with uh, the safe overclocking options as well where you can use the Intel software to overclock safely. So with the proper cooling, uh, which is really important for overclocking, really important for, for processor performance, this Intel i9, sorry, Intel i7 is more than enough. I have an Intel i9, I have Intel i9, I believe 10900K. Uh, which is overkill. I don't even use the entire uh, you know uh, capabilities of this processor except when I'm rendering uh, my um, my uh, 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 HD videos, 4K videos. I do use most of it. In fact, I hit 100% of the this processor when I'm uh, using i9 uh, <laughs> uh, processor to run my 4K rendering. But other than that, you know, it's not really like the benchmarks. Well, if, if the needs of your end user, needs of you uh, is satisfied, doesn't really matter what server processor or what desktop processor you use, as long as it doesn't get, uh, you know, capped out uh, on a general use as well as the, you know, high end use. So whatever, whatever the user is using, if the user is a high end user, if your processor is not capping out, I wouldn't worry about the benchmark. For example, I wouldn't worry about Intel i9 10900K versus uh, AMD Ryzen, 99300TX. Uh, Look at the difference. Like, it doesn't really matter. But I would worry about if you are recommending an uh, Intel uh, Athlon processor to someone who actually need an Intel i5 or above.
that would matter but in terms of benchmark between the uh, items close to near each other it doesn't really matter i would when even when it's come to the point servers it doesn't really matter so for in my opinion if you, the process that you're picking fits the need of your end user don't worry too much about benchmark uh, on uh, any of these items cooling ah the school breeze that you always need huh so some desktop and server processors comes with all required components in the box for cooling those include the heat sink thermal paste uh, and all the screws and everything as uh, you need to attach that to uh, your motherboard so the thermal paste uh, may already be pre-applied at the bottom of the heat sink uh, when it comes in all in one package uh, but however you may need to select a better cooling solution because uh, most of these all-in-one um, packages uh, from both intel and amd that you can buy typically don't have the best heat sink and best thermal paste uh, configuration uh, and therefore you can you know complement that with a better cooling solution uh, also when you're purchasing uh, processors there may be two options to buy the same processor. Like for example, if you go back in here, if I want to buy the Intel i9-10900K, it may come with two options. One that include everything in the box, including the cooling components and the one without it. If you're going to build your own um, uh, device, uh, cooling uh, option uh, with other third party uh, you know, um, options, I would recommend that you buy the uh, box uh, that does not come with the heat sink and the thermal paste. You just buy the chip. So that's what I did. You can buy Intel i9 processors, for example, just the chip only in a box. That way you can decide whether you're gonna go with the high performance air coolers or whether you're gonna go with the liquid coolers, which is not recommended uh, for typical enterprise or small business environments. Uh, but uh, you know, I've never seen any small business or enterprise server ever use liquid cooling except on those university research labs and NASA computers servers with uh, you know huge huge liquid cooling systems built into it. Uh, typically, uh, enterprise servers and small business servers will just use the air cooling and it will have uh, the, its own built-in air cooling uh, mechanisms and you don't usually use even third-party components. For example, if I buy an HP enterprise server i will use hp cooling components i'm not going to go out of my way to get a, another cooling uh, specification specific device for that hp servers however with desktop computers especially specifically for desktop computers uh, including um, some business environment computers you may use uh, end up using high performance air coolers or liquid coolers even so like if you are working uh, for a company that do uh, 4K rendering, like let's say it's a, a movie production company, you may end up building uh, end devices with liquid coolers on it. Uh, so rack mountable server cases will have limited cooling options because it is not required to go beyond what it is recommended by the manufacturers. And that's why I meant by saying like, if I'm gonna uh, install a enterprise server such as an HP server, I'm not gonna go out of my way to install any different cooling solutions than what it is already recommended by the, the manufacturer. When it comes to buying liquid cooling, you can buy these type of all-in-one, all closed uh, loop uh, liquid coolers, or uh, you can go with uh, a liquid cooler that has a different reservoir, and you can build your own custom liquid cooling design, especially with gaming machines. When it's coming to high-end air coolers, uh, they can have a more fins uh, spanning out from the, the heat sink uh, and could support a really high-end uh, uh, you know, method of uh, uh, drawing the, uh, the heat away uh, from your uh, processor, right? So this is an example of uh, such um, you know, um, high-end uh, air cooler. And the servers, uh, as I mentioned, um, we typically use the whatever it comes with it. This is what a server cooler sometimes usually look like. And they are very low profile, again, uh, for reasons because of the, uh, especially with the rack mountable servers. Uh, and it has a specific air cooling uh, built into it as uh, the, the server processors do produce a lot of heat. Uh, but uh, it is these type of coolers are more than enough to uh, take that heat away from the uh, chip, uh, the CPU, uh, and uh, you know do the job uh, for you. So again, 
when it's come to the point rack mountable servers enterprise servers even small business servers you are most likely going to use whatever the cooling solutions that comes with in the box or in the case uh, of that uh, or with the, the with the, uh, the provider so if you directly purchase a enterprise server from hp or ibm or dell uh, you're going to just going to use whatever it comes with it but when it's come to the point desktop computers uh, for uh, companies end users as well as gaming computers you may want to look into high performance uh, air coolers as well as liquid coolers because that will reduce thermal throt throttling and you, that way you can get most out of uh, your cpu's capabilities right because thermal throttling basic basically dumb down or uh, gonna bottleneck your uh, cpu's ability to perform at its highest level Installing Intel desktop processors. So always read the motherboard user guide and follow directions, regardless of whether it's an Intel processor or an AMD processor. Make sure you read the motherboard user guide and follow directions. However, the general procedure for installing Intel processors described in the A plus certification program can be summarized with these nine steps. So use a anti-static strap, uh, or anti-static gloves or even anti-static mats that you available in the market you can put it onto the floor so that when you walk around on that mat uh, th there is no static electricity build up uh, so that you don't fry anything uh, when replacing a processor make sure you power down the system unplug the power cord and hold the power button a few seconds uh, to drain the system power and then open the case some motherboards do have leds indicating whether the power has completely drained so you can look for those as well uh, remove the socket uh, protective cover so you have a protective plastic cover when you first buy a motherboard a brand new motherboard you just need to remove that and then open the socket by pushing down the socket lever uh, lever uh, and uh, gently push away uh, from the socket to lift the car lever and as you lift the lever, the socket uh, load uh, plate is raised and then remove the protective cover from the processor. So the processor will also come with the protective cover and hold the processor with the index finger and the thumb and align the processor so that the two notches, because those are the notches that comes in the Intel on the edges of the processor to line up uh, with the uh, embedded, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the socket. So the, you need to line up the pro you, you need to line up the two notches on the edge of the processor uh, with the the post embedded in the socket itself. And then you're gonna need to ensure the process is aligned correctly in the socket. And finally, you need to push down on the lever so that it will gently returns, uh, uh, you know, into into the socket uh, position. On my next slide, I will show you an image of the this uh, whatever you know what, what I'm talking about here on the uh, point number seven, where they are the, where these notches are coming into play. So now we're going to look at how we can install AMD desktop processors. Again, please make sure you refer to your manuals and motherboard manual as well as the processor manual for more information but typically this is the process recommended by a plus certification program courses so first you're going to open the socket lever and remove protective cover orient the four empty uh, pin position on the bottom with the four filled hole positions in the socket and carefully place the processor in the socket Next, we're going to verify the processor pins are sitting slightly uh, into the um, holes and then press the lever down and gently uh, into the position. Apply the thermal paste compound after that and install the cooler. Then clip into the place um, the clipping mechanism on the side of the cooler and then connect the fan and cord and power it on. So that's pretty much how the AMD processor uh, would be installed. And the bottom of your screen, uh, you have two images. One of the images is the Intel. So this is the Intel processor uh, socket. And this is the AMD processor socket. So in the Intel processor sockets, uh, because it is the LGA type, we're going to have the, uh, the notches at the corners. Those are the two notches. And you're going to align your processor's notch against those notches and gently drop the notch, uh, so drop the processor into this socket. 
and then you're gonna take this lever right here and then you pull, pull it, push it down and that's gonna secure into the place. Remember the Intel processors have a different, um, um, you know, it's, it's a land grid array LGA. Uh, so, and compared to the, um, uh, the AMD processors, you will have pins coming out of the uh, chip itself and the socket will not have any of these metal uh, pieces sticking out. Instead, it will have holes in it and you will be dropping the processor into those holes, uh, aligning those pins in there and then you're going to push this lever down. And you can see in here there are four alignment uh, positions uh, on the back of your uh, chip. So on the AMD CPU, you're gonna align those alignment positions against the uh, those alignment positions shown on the the uh, on the socket itself. So that's how you know that you're dropping in correctly. Also, AMD processors do sometimes uh, actually more often time comes with a tiny arrow on the top uh, corner. So like right here, there is a tiny arrow on the socket itself, and there's going to be a tiny arrow in the uh, in the on the uh, processor. Uh, itself, itself as well and you can align them as well uh, as a secondary like another option to make sure that you're dropping it correctly so it is important that you actually insert them correctly and never use force to insert these processors the what's one of the key things that you should remember is you should never ever use force like you don't use a hammer or a pry bar or something like that you don't push it down with a, a really hard with your fingers or palm or something like that you never do that with any of the processors whether it's a intel or amd you just gently drop it here you gently drop it here you push a little bit with your maybe thumb and then just push down the lever and that lever is the one that are actually gonna secure the processor to the motherboard. Then you can apply the thermal paste and you can apply the cooling mechanisms and etc. etc. Installing server processors. So you can follow the same uh, process as the desktop CPU uh, installation uh, and follow the guidelines that I have previously mentioned whether uh, depending on whether you're going to use a LGA type socket or whether you're going to type uh, you, you're going to use the uh, you know ZIF uh, socket so uh, either way uh, uh, you know whatever you use just follow the same uh, process except uh, with servers there are a couple of things that you need to take into account they include uh, servers with multiple CPU support you need to follow the manufacturer's guideline on uh, how um, you're gonna populate them when, uh, especially when you are partially populating the uh, the CPUs. So for example, on the left-hand side, here's a uh, server board with one, two, three, four uh, CPUs. And uh, there is no requirement to populate all the available CPU sockets uh, uh, at the time of the installation. Like maybe your company want to save some money initially and just buy this board and populate only one of them or populate only two of them. In that case, make sure you follow the manufacturer's guideline and populate the right one. So you don't populate like random one here. Maybe this is number one, this is two, this is three, this is four. Maybe this is one, two, three, four. So maybe this is one, this is two, this is two, three, this is four. So just follow the guideline and the procedures for this your particular server board. And if you're partially populating it, populate the first CPU first, second CPU next, third CPU third, and the fourth CPU fourth in that order. You don't make mix up the order because modern day uh, uh, server board may be able to handle that, but typically we don't recommend that. So make sure if you're partially populating, especially you are doing partial population, make sure you do it uh, according to the manufacturer's guideline. If you're populating all four of them, uh, you can uh, populate any way you like. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, when you're installing it, all of them are populated. When it's come to the point RAM, it, if not populated on all slots, if you are not pop, if you have um, a CPU located here um, and you have the RAM bank associated here and the this CPU here and RAM bank here and the CPU here, RAM bank here, CPU here, RAM bank here. So the, every RAM bank here is associated with the CPU nearby. Uh, I believe it's this to this, or it could be this to this. It doesn't matter. Again, just check the manual. If you are not populating all the sorts uh, of the RAM banks in here, 
uh, but you have let's say two CPUs installed here but you only have enough RAM for populate half of them then what you need to do is you need to make sure you evenly distribute your CPU RAM banks in order to maximize performance so let's say here we have one two three four five six seven eight so uh, eight times to 16 so we need 16 um, uh, RAM slot, uh, cards to populate uh, a two CPUs right but let's say you only have uh, 10 um, uh, RAM uh, modules available. In that case, you're going to populate 5 here and populate 5 here. Or maybe populate 6 here and populate 4 here, depending on your board, because there's the dual channel is better. So I, I would, in that case, if you have 10, I'll put populate, um, uh, you know, populate 6 here and populate 4 here maybe. Or uh, if you have, let's say, 12 RAMs available, you put 6 here, 6 here. In that case evenly distributed so whatever you do try to distribute your uh, limited resources across your multiple uh, cpus and ram when you're installing server processes that is very very important otherwise you're going to create bottleneck effect uh, so you're basically buying a really good xeon processor for example or in this case this is an amd i believe threadripper type uh, uh, or a pick type uh, server configuration and then you're not getting the maximum out of your uh, processors. So keep that in mind. Uh, the recommend, we recommend that you use the exact same CPU model. So these server boards may support multiple different uh, server CPU models. So for example, Intel have several Xeon uh, models, uh, AMD have several Threadripper models. So if you're actually using the, a particular uh, uh, CPU model, it is recommended that you populate all four of them using the same uh, CPU model. On some multi-CPU server motherboard, it is possible to mix them and not have a headache, um, <clears throat> but it is still gonna create bottleneck effects and some issues like most of the CPUs, like I, I shouldn't say some, all CPU, all motherboards, all server motherboards in 2022 would support multi-CPU uh you know mixing but however it is not recommended so generally mixing cpu types or models are not recommended in enterprise or business environment because that that's another variable that you don't want to deal with so that's why okay so keep that in mind installing cooler assembly so here's a typical cooler assembly installation uh, because the reason why I use the term typical because not all cool assemblies uh, may not be using the similar methodologies and this back bracket uh, can be designed in many many different ways like it could be designed in a different way especially on servers uh, where uh, uh, the HP or IBM uh, is providing you with the server coolers they might have a different types of brackets but generally what you need to do is to Understand how the cooler post work. The post are these uh, four holes right here. One, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. And the back, this is the back side of that this board. Uh, so the, the that's where the screw holes going in. And all CPUs, including server CPUs, will have these uh, holes available uh, on the co four corners of the C each CPU. And so you need to understand where and how those cooler posts uh, going to work. Then apply the thermal compound if necessary, uh, if it is not pre-applied. Uh, then some heavy uh, coolers um, uh, provide a plate that fits underneath the motherboard. And you need to install that plate. That's what we are talking about here. Um, and if the plate is provided, you need to apply that plate. So this is that plate I'm talking about so right here. See that metal plate? So some heavy coolers will have that metal plate. Uh, not so heavy coolers might have a plastic plate or no plate at all. So it could have, they might have the screw, uh, like a, some kind of a stub here, like it's just, just this part, not the plain plate at all. But typically, uh, most plate uh, would have come with at least a plastic plate, even not heavy ones nowadays in 2022. And this is what it looked like. So what you need to make sure is that you're going to make sure you fit this plate in the back of the motherboard properly. So after the plate is installed, the cooler on the top of the processor can be installed. So for lighter coolers with locking pins, uh, so uh, especially with AMD uh, processors, 
and uh, sometimes comes with uh, you know the the pins where you can uh, just put it into a locking pin and then the cool assembly will fit in without the plate in the back verify the locking pins are turned counterclockwise as far as they will go so make sure you push on each locking pin until it pops into the hole as and then it will you know secure the cooler so basically you will have pins in here instead of these holes you will have a pin sometimes it's just a one pin actually and those locking pins will lock the cooler in place um, whatever you do a couple of things you need to make sure motherboards are made out of plastic right this board right here is plastic because it has to be plastic otherwise it's going to be electrically conductive that's going to be really bad right so whenever you install in the cooler don't you know if you're going to push hard on the on the cooler to make sure the locking pins uh, set into place although these screws are properly aligned and uh, tighten enough whenever you do that put it on a flat surface the motherboard or hold it with your other hand and then push it don't put too much pressure because it might result in a crack on your board i have friends who have tried to install these coolers on their gaming pcs and they end up cracking their uh, motherboard and if it, if the crack is on a, one of those traces where there are electrical conductivity needs to be there uh, you basically destroy your motherboard you have to buy a brand new motherboard in that case right so be careful whenever you are installing whether it's a cpu uh, uh, whether you're installing ram whether you're installing coolers or anything on a, on a computer be gentle and be mindful of how much pressure you are applying to install those components that require some pressure to install and finally once you are done that you need to connect the power cord from the cooler fan to the motherboard so basically you will have a power cord on the uh, on the uh, on the cooler fan you're going to connect that power cord to the motherboard so it was somewhere in the motherboard maybe there is some pins uh, that you can connect um, where, uh, the, the cooler gonna uh, uh, fit in and then finally you need to check the uh, bios and or uefi setup to verify the system recognize the processor after system up and running so in my case uh, i had a, a computer that had an intel i7 3770k so once i have installed it i went into the uh, uefi or bios settings and it actually showed that the computer's motherboard have recognized the intel processor and it's showing right here so i would just to make sure to verify that it is recognized you can go to the uefi and check and verify that i mean you don't need to do this step because if the CPU is not recognized, you won't be able to boot into the, uh, you know, you won't be able to op uh, install an operating system, for example. But as a computer technician, as a computer IT professional, you always take these steps to make sure that each time we have done something that we verify, we do it, did it correctly. So because in the next step, when you're trying to install your operating system, if you get any error messages or something like that uh, with respect to CPU, you probably had to do this anyway so might as well do it right now so as soon as you install your cpu put the thermal paste put install the cooler and everything check on the bios if the motherboard have recognized your processor in this case i'm showing intel i7 uh, 3770k now don't worry about these arrows again because this is coming from an article from my website right here so that's why uh, these arrows are there but yeah just just to show you that it does recognize so finally let's look at how we can replace a laptop processor so laptops are compact devices hence uh, unless the device is out of warranty it is more time consuming and costly for you as a technician to replace processors on a laptops on site so rather than doing it on site if there is a possibility uh, you can send the laptop back to the manufacturer for a cheap price or under warranty that would be the best option for laptop processor replacement again processors are rarely replaced anyway even on desktop uh, boards uh, my, with respect to server boards maybe once in a while you may replace a processor but again it is rarely replaced processors rarely break down rarely burn out um, unless you really do something uh, wrong like overclocking incorrectly with not enough cooling for example so 
unless there is a really need for an on-site replacement of laptop processors, I would not do it on-site. But if you really want to do it, uh, these are the steps um, suggested by the A plus certification program. Uh, basically use a CPU supported by the manufacturer uh, and the laptop or notebook model. <coughs> So you need to make sure uh, that whatever the uh, laptop CPU you're going to pick will fit into that particular laptop. Remember, you not only have to think about the socket type, but you also have to think about whether the laptop can support it too, right? Maybe some other laptops, actually some laptop motherboard will have socket types that will uh, fit in many different um, uh, CPUs, but the mother, but the mother, other components on the motherboard doesn't support it like the RAM or other things, right? Be careful with that chipset, for example. Uh, for some laptops, remove the cover on the bottom of the uh, expose, uh, uh, you, know, you know, on the cover on the bottom and expose the processor fan and heat shrink assembly. Remove the seven screws uh, and the fan power connector. Typically it's seven screws, but again, depending on your laptop, there may be more screws or less screws. You can then lift the CPU straight up from the socket without bending the CPU pins. So you need to just straight pull it up. And before placing the new processor into the socket, be sure the, the socket screw is open, in the open position, because otherwise if you try to push it down, it might bend pins and stuff like that if it is in a closed position. And place the processor into the socket. Then uh, after closing the socket, uh, make sure that the thermal compound on top of the processor is properly applied. I just want to point out one more thing with associated with laptop uh, CPU replacement or even laptop RAM re replacement. Uh, laptops like manufactured by Apple, for example, MacBook Pros, uh, and some uh, laptops by Asus and Sony and many companies, you had to remove the keyboard to access the uh, processor or certain other components. I believe um, some of the uh, if you have to, if you want to replace the uh, SSD or uh, M.2 drive on some of the Asus and Apple computers laptops, you had to remove the keyboard. Like it's on the keyboard side, so you had to remove the back panel and you had to remove this entire motherboard from all these screws. And on the other side, on the keyboard side of things, you will have the access to the uh, the the RAM and other modules. So keep in mind, so laptops are a little bit more complicated because each manufacturers have uh, their own way of uh, configuring the hardware components to fit into that uh, limited space. So keep that in mind when you're doing uh, replacement or any, any type of services, including RAM uh, replacement services uh, for uh, laptops. <laughs> And that would bring us to the end of this lecture. If you have any questions related to the topics that we have covered today, you are more than welcome to reach out to me by either leaving a comment in the video or by reaching out to me through my sanuja.com website. And please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel. And until next time, good luck and have a nice day.